afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the New Era Friendship Garden here in uh, not so sunny Brandon, Manitoba. We're here today to talk to expert botanist May Elsinger. She's agreed to let us in on, on the tricks of the trade that she employed to uh, plant this lovely uh, native plant garden. This is our first talk and our first post for uh, national or I guess it's international pollinator week. So with that I'm gonna let May kick off and uh, talk to us about Actually, about five uh, years ago, Blake Hamilton, he runs this uh, this friendship garden here. He came to me about uh, five years ago, and uh, he knew where there was a gravel pit with some uh, some some native plants in it that he thought needed rescuing. So um, so he and I talked about it. We we talked with some provincial people about the ethics uh, of taking native plants out of their habitat, so-called rescuing them. And uh, yeah, our idea was to bring these, these kind of plugs of these native plants, so basically islands of plants, and to, to stick them in this bed um, to you know, preserve them and to, to educate the community. So like I said, it's been five years, and um, after five years, it, it took quite a while to, uh, to develop this wealth of green vegetation and, and flowers. And uh, yeah, it, um, I see lots of bees visiting. Um, I've, uh, I did an enumeration last week and uh, counted 27 different wildflower species. I have uh, about eight or nine grasses in here that are native to Manitoba. And uh, I also have three shrubs. So, uh, yeah. As you can see, there's a, a bit of color. There's a lot of white uh, in the garden. Uh, these guys are just, just starting to flower. These are tall white zinc foils, and uh, they put out a lot of seeds, so I have several of those plants. Now what this spray of white here is, uh, is uh, northern bed straw, and it flowers for quite a long time, and it smells just beautiful. And it's kind of a creeping species, so it's kind of moving about the, about the plot. Uh, here uh, you'll see in hopefully two, maybe three weeks time, these are the yellow cone flowers, uh, so they'll have a, a, a they're going to develop a very brown head, and then it'll be a skirt of yellow petals around the, the outer part of it. So uh, yeah, and then our grasses, the dominant grass here is green needle grass. It is native to Manitoba and uh, and the rest of the prairies, and uh, it's a very prolific uh, seed producer and, uh, and very easy to grow. So as you can see, it's taking over the plot, and uh, I'm hoping to, to manage it a little bit later. Come around this way, there's a little bit more color. Okay, over the last half hour, okay, this is, this is a cheat, this is not a native species, but it was here, it said, I want a flower for you, so it flowered. So I've watched over the last about half hour or so, this guy was, has, was closing, it was open, it was about halfway open now, and it has been closing over last, slowly over the last half hour. So I think that's, that's interesting. Um, but anyways, yeah, he's welcome to, to stay. Now, the greatest, uh, the best color I think right now is this, you know, with the spray of northern bed straw. Um, you see, we have the, the bluebells. They're actually, to me, they look more like a purple, but they call them a bluebell anyway. So that makes a nice contrast up against the white. And I have a few patches of those, and they'll be continuing over the next uh, few weeks. They, they just kind of come and go. And uh, you might be familiar with this one. This is one of our first spring uh, plants here. Um, three flowered avens, or sometimes called prairie smoke. Now you see it in its prairie smoke sort of stage where the, the flowers have come and gone. And actually, if the seeds pull off very easily, that means they're ready to, they're ripe and they're ready to come off. So I just, you know, scratch them into the earth, pat them over, hope for rain, and uh, hopefully I'll get more. So this guy here, this is like super huge. This is an alum root. 
and you normally don't see them like this in nature. I think because it has its own space and I water it, it looks very grand. And the bees do love it uh, when it's flowering. And um, I would say it's pretty well done flowering. It's got a kind of a nondescript greenish white flower. But yeah, it's supplying a lot of flowers. And uh, down here, this is an er also an early spring plant. Um, it's uh, got a nice spray of star-shaped uh, white flowers. Uh, it's a very wonderful thing to spot in the spring. And uh, its fruit co fruits come out as these berries that pop open eventually when they dry up and, uh, and give up their seed. So, like I said, this, this garden didn't come about overnight. Um, Blake and I took about, I'll say, eight to ten plugs out of this gravel pit where we were rescuing these native species from. And uh, we put them in here and, um, and watered them and, uh, and just kind of kind of let them do their own thing. Um, because they came from an area that had a lot of invasive uh, species like uh, Kentucky bluegrass and, um, and leafy spurge, um, my management was to, uh, to come every week or so and pull out pull out the Kentucky bluegrass and basically mine it until uh, it became no more. And uh, yeah, that was my, my big management for the first few years. Um, yeah, so it was a lot of bare dirt, some of these tiny islands of plants. And, and now if I squat down, you know, and look through it and the wind is, is, is blowing through it, it's, it, to me, it looks like a native prairie because I've been out on two native prairies and that's just what it looks like. So May, what would you say to people who are interested in creating their own native gardens? I know one of the things that can be challenging for people is, is patience. You said that this is a five-year-old garden, so it's mature enough that you you see the blooming throughout the season. Uh, I know people uh, like the instant gratification of an annual garden or the introduced species because they're so much showier and they're immediate and it looks great right away. So what kind of advice would you have for people on, on plant, planting like this? Yeah, definitely it's, it's an exercise in patience. But to me, it's it's more about the journey and, and try, trying to ease the, the plants towards, uh, you know, what, I, what I'm hoping to get. And sometimes it's just taking what you get. Um, you know, you might seed 20, 27 species in, in a plot and you might get three. Well, you coax those three along when they put out seed, you know, you, you reseed it and you keep trying again, um, you know, with other native seed. And uh, yeah, you pull the weeds, um, you, you clip some plants to manage. Um, yeah, it's uh, so for me, it's more about the journey. If I wanted instant gratification, I would plant a, you know, a domesticated annual or perennial garden, um, which, I, which I do on the side as well. I have my own vegetable garden just over there. So, uh, but yeah, this one is about the journey and about the, to me, it's like a meditation, getting in there and, and going in and finding things, finding weeds, something to pull out that doesn't belong there. Or sitting back and deciding, okay, I would like, uh, you know, I see a little plant in there, you know, I'd like it to get a little bit more sun and opportunity. And I kind of, yeah, brought some shears along to demonstrate what I want to do in the next few weeks or so. As you see, these... Uh, these uh, green needle grasses are quite abundant. Uh, you know, I have no worry about them disappearing if I make a wrong move. But what I want to do is, is open up, you know, a niche for, for those plants to, uh, for these smaller plants. Like I've got a little milkweed here. There's a little hyssop right here. Maybe I want to open that up. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look around, try to get a hand around this grass here. I'm just gonna trim it right off. Now, there's very little harm in doing this once during the season. These plants come from the Canadian prairies, which evolved under bison grazing and fire. They're used to being defoliated during the summer. So I'll cut this off here. 
leave a little bit of stumps. So now I've opened it up a little bit for this milkweed here. I'm going to do the same over here for this other milkweed. And you know, within a few weeks, you can come and see for yourselves if you're in town that this grass is just going to regrow. It's a very hardy grass. So there, I've opened it up for that milkweed. Now I want to open it up for this hyssop as well. Now, maybe people might uh, not think to plant grasses in with their native uh, garden. They might think, no, it's, it's all about the flowers, right? But can you talk to us a bit about the supporting role that, that native grasses play? Oh yes, grasses are, you know, if you go out to a true prairie, you go out there and you look and you put your head down, you see it's mostly grass, no fooling. So, you know, there's definitely a place in the grass, in the native community for grass. Now grass is great. It provides cover. It protects the soil from, uh, from uh, eroding. Um, it provides nesting for birds. Uh, nesting for invertebrates, bees, bees, uh, you know, and, and moths and whatever will crawl up to the top of the stems to rest. Um, yeah, so there's definitely a role that uh, that grasses can play. I believe there's some grasses that are so large that even very small bees might nest because grasses have hollow stems, right? Yeah. So the bees might, uh, you know, the the cavity nesting bees might use them for nesting. Plus, I mean, it's just a, it's such a very nice protected area in there for invertebrates. Actually, when I was cutting out of a, a, um, a ladybug crawled out of the, out of the litter there. There, so now I've opened it for these two, uh, two milkweeds and, uh, and this hyssop and also this, this little sedge here. This little sedge is a gorgeous little ground cover. And, uh, yeah, I'd like to, there's my little ladybug there crawling out of the, so, the litter. So, I, you know, you talked about doing this selective. Would, would you ever consider mowing the entire thing or burning? Would, is, is burning a tool that you would like to use? Can you use it on this plot? Yeah, I would not uh, want to use burning here, uh, you know, due to the social yeah. issues involved. But, you know, if I had my own backyard or I was out on an acreage, I would, I would certainly want to, to burn this. Now, or mow it. I could even mow it right off. Um, I probably wouldn't do it now because of the because of the flowers and the, and the live creatures using them. But in the fall, when uh, you know when the plants go dormant and are less likely to be harmed, uh, we can we can do some some massive mowing. Uh, probably mow it a little bit high in the fall to leave the litter on the surface so as not to uh, disturb, say. Uh, Burning, I'm not sure what the, uh, you know, what are the best times for, for invertebrates for, for burning to occur. So I'd want to be cautious about burning anyways. But mowing is a, is a suitable tool for, I think, what I want to accomplish with these garden, or a garden like it on an acreage. But uh, yeah, I would choose the, the dormant season for, for that kind of thing, to, for less harm though. So yeah, I do. I definitely prefer the setup, and it's it's more it's more of an adventure when you go in and you choose which. Okay, I want that one to emerge, so I'm gonna cut the grass out from around it. Yeah. Now you, you've already had you know great success with putting in you know your species. You said you're sitting at about 27 species. Do you have plans on bringing more in and transitioning out of any of these, or what are your, what are your long-term goals? And I know you find great satisfaction in, in cuttering, and I know a lot of people that's half of gardening, as you pointed out, to the meditative qualities of it. Uh, do you plan on putting more in? Now, would you go? Would you put more in using seeds, or would you use plugs? Yeah, I. I if I had some kind of rescue, you know, I might see if I can find a spot, a space that's not occupied. Um, if somebody wants to donate plant material, like live plant material, I'd try to find space. Actually, some of this uh, plant material does come from the uh, I got to thank Jane Thornton for giving me a lot of these um, sidled scrambled grasses. Uh, she 
had them in her backyard. She was building a shed and said, you know, give some grass. Um, another thing I like to do is when I'm out walking on the prairies and some, some seeds are ready, I'll grab them and stick them in and see what happens to them. Uh, what's interesting is some plants I, I've seeded and it's taken them two years to come. So, you know, mm -hmm. when the seed is resting on the soil, something's happening to it through the winter, through the fall, it, you know, to make the seed ready to, to emerge. Um, so, yeah, back to your question about, you know, what would I put in? Just kind of whatever I find, um, see if it works. Um, and yeah, just work on managing the expression of the different things that are already in here. You know, for example, this tiny little hyssop. You know, I've seen hyssops out on, you know, out on the prairie that are yay tall. Or I've seen hyssops that other people were growing there, they're in a bunch. You know, I'd like to, yeah, get that little guy, and he's my only one, to mm -hmm. express himself a little more. Now I know we really uh, discourage people from digging in ditches and, you know, I mean, people see these beautiful flowers in the ditch and they, and they go out and dig up lady slippers and, and things like that. Uh, you know, what can you, what can you counsel people on doing that ethically? And where should they be looking if they are going to rescue them? What's the difference between rescuing versus maybe digging in a spot that they should be leaving alone? Yeah, there's a lot of uh, a lot of cautions related to going out into nature and digging up plants. Um, when it comes to rescuing, like you know, is it up to you to do that rescue? Um, if you're concerned about a place that you think the plants need rescuing, um, you really need to talk to the landowner. Uh, but you also need to talk to, uh, in, in some cases, uh, conservation or, or the botanical experts uh, to make sure, you know, is this a rare plant that needs to be stuck in place? Is this, uh, you know, something that should not be dug up? Is this something that can be dug up safely? Um, uh, is it something that can be dug up legally? Um, and, uh, you know, there, there's that aspect of it. And then, okay, there's the aspect of, um, Enable, like if we were to rescue all the plants that we thought need rescuing, we'd be enabling development in places that shouldn't be developed. So um, it kind of it, it kind of detracts or you know takes away from efforts to you know to conserve what's in place, to protect what's in place. Uh, the thing that is really difficult about um, transplanting is, do you think? You can take it out of its natural environment and put it into a place with a similar environment. Okay? This means sunlight. This means the same type of soil, the same hydrological regime. Does it pick up water? Does it store water? Even the water chemistry, can you can you restore that too? And when you dig it up, you know, can you dig it up with all of its um, its soil symbionts? You know, there's bacteria, fungi in the soil. You can't go out and dig up a lady slipper and hope that it survives. There's hydrological implications of why that lady slipper is there. There's microbiological symbionts in the soil that it relies on. The aspect of the sun, the, the, cohabitant, the cohabiting plants. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a, it's a really big question to, to ask when you're thinking about digging up plants from nature. Now I know in, in Manitoba we're really trying to encourage the native uh, plant producers mm -hmm. and we've been fortunate to work on projects and, and you've done a lot of seed sourcing from Manitoba sources. Do you want to give a shout out to those and sort of talk a bit about where people might be able to uh, purchase native plant seeds and, and live material? Yeah, I've, I've had really great success with both live plant material and seeds uh, from some of our Manitoba producers. I would encourage people to uh, to Google native plants seeds Manitoba or native plants Manitoba and, and search for our uh, Manitoba vendors. Um, they would be definitely happy to hear from you.
I know you gave me a little bit of a list of, of some resources, and we are going to uh, post uh, these resources, the Native Plant Rescue, and again, just, just Google Native uh, Seeds Manitoba, Native Plants Manitoba, and it'll, it will get you there. Um, May has also been gracious enough. She sent me some photos that will be uh, available to look at, and she's going to take some pictures throughout the growing season to uh, let us see these different uh, plants as they come into bloom, which I think will be exciting. Because that is, that is the fantastic thing about native plants and why we promote them so heavily for uh, native pollinators, because native pollinators emerge at different times of the year and they've evolved uh, alongside their, their native plants that they need for food. So as they emerge, it's when their plants are, are blooming and so it's nice to see the different, uh, the different plants bloom and the, and the different pollinators come out and, and so May is going to take those pictures and we can watch as it grows throughout the season. I definitely look forward to taking shots and, and forwarding them along. And uh, we're at uh, New Era Friendship Garden uh, on the, uh, the intersection of Fourth and Louise, right by the New Era School. If you want to drop by and take a poke around, uh, it's the uh, garden right as you come in the south gate. And I think what's so fantastic about it is sometimes the thought of creating a native uh, planting can be really daunting and people seem to think, oh, it needs to be huge, it needs to be massive, but obviously, you know, this plot does so much and provides so much habitat and packs so many different species into a small area that, you know, it help, will help people get their head around the fact that it doesn't have to be massive. You just have to start and yep. do your plant selection. There, there are a number of resources, the Pollinator Partnership Canada has some uh, new guides that they've put out that specifically talk to selecting plants for Manitoba. So that's a, a great resource to go on as well. We'll provide the, the link in there. Uh, maybe I'll turn to our cameraman. This is quite see. a comment, Melanie. Oh, I was going to ask if there are any questions yeah. that have okay. that come up. But sure. if you want to, if you want to do a comment before yeah, we Yeah, I just want to say uh, related to what you just said, uh, um, this garden doesn't stand alone. Like, uh, if we all create our own little gardens, uh, there's several uh, native gardeners in this neighborhood. Um, and uh, there's apple trees and Saskatoon. Uh, so there's a, a great connectivity um, associated with just this little garden. And just to let people know, if you missed the start of the talk, um, this will be archived on the B City Brandon website, and and you can access it at any time. And I think we we've managed to cover off the questions that people were putting in there. Yeah. So, um, okay. Great. Yes. Okay. Anything you'd like to add? I think we covered a lot. Yeah. It's, uh, it's been fun uh, growing this garden, and uh, it's a great adventure. And uh, I would encourage anybody just to start small, even a four foot by four foot square. I have an associate in, in Carberry who did just that. She uh, just threw some seeds in the ground in a, in a spot and two, three years later, she's definitely enjoying the, the fruits of her labors. Uh, and for her, it's a, a journey of discovery. Uh, it's managing, pulling the weeds, and yeah, going out, finding more seeds, and dropping them in, and see what happens. Thanks again, May. We, we really appreciate you doing this for us. And, uh, and we look forward to seeing uh, the talks as the garden progresses through the season. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Goodbye.